What is that piece? I should know the what what that is. Is that a? That is, it's, it's from the good, the bad, the ugly. Spanish caravan. From Dulles, yeah. yeah. What is it? <laughs> well, they used it in Spanish caravan. The oh, Dulles, okay. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Right. From the beginning, yeah. Okay. Um, but you know what? What is their official? It, it, oh no, yeah, of course. It's yeah. uh, it's a piano piece actually. Ah. By Isaac Albanus. Okay. Uh, Spanish piano composer, P- child prodigy. Right. And he wrote a suite of uh, pieces about traveling around Spain. So. Right. Uh, and that's that's the middle part. It's called Asturias. Right. Yeah. And I'd I'd noticed a guitar piece. I don't know whether people like Paco de Lucci and all these guys have, have, have sort of made it to uh, like a, a famously a guitar piece, or whether. You know, well, yeah. I don't know why you I think know, of it that way here. That piece, um, you have a guy called uh, Francesco Tarraga, who okay. was the first guy to transcribe it, which was in the time of uh, same time as Isaac Albaner. So right. Isaac Albaner heard it. He said it sounded very nice. He thought it sounded huh. better than the piano version. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, uh, Often it is, uh, isn't it, with the case of guitars? That would have been like, you know, 1900 or something. Uh-huh. Maybe now, a bit later. We should just jump back. You're, you're, you're playing in the whale, and, and I've known you for, for quite a while now, and I love the fact that you've got this dual thing where obviously you really love uh, what you're doing with, with the Brahms guitar, and, and you're also like like everybody else. You have your rock and roll, and we did a Pixies thing together, and we've done, you know, different. Uh, but I'm just wondering, yeah. at what point were you a teenager when you got the bug for this, or was it was it later on in life? Like, because it is an odd kind of choice to make that I'm going to go for this eight string guitar that, a you can't buy in the shop and and, and, and yeah, you know it's sure. going to be. I mean, the first thing is to be playing classical guitar, you know, right. six string, that nylon string Spanish guitar, for, for, as most people would call it. Hmm. Um, I it was absolute luck for me that I got involved in classical guitar. I was learning originally from my parents and then a uh, friend of mine in school was playing and he had lessons and I just went I went for lessons with his teacher his teacher was a classical guitar teacher and it right. was, you know that was kind of but I would have done I would have learned any any genre I just loved I used to get books and just eat them up you know <laughs> I'd buy books and anywhere I could find them and just right. learn them all and, and, and the, the, but the but the Brahms guitar that, that was that something that, that uh, how did that come into the picture yeah that came later I mean I was already pretty ingrained in being a classical guitarist I was in college okay. I was doing a degree, a performance degree, and uh, I went to a festival in Scotland. This was my first time on an airplane. <laughs> 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 yeah, I went a long way. And, um, and I saw this guy, Paul Garbrade, playing the string guitar. Right. And he played a piece that I played at the time, which is uh, Bach. I found a few Allegro. And uh, I was like, oh, just sounds amazing, you know. He had all these bass yeah. notes, which yeah. are missing <laughs> from my version. Right? So, um, and I had a class with him the next day, and just everything was amazing. He was just, you know, he's a, he he still is one of the world's best guitarists. And um, I was completely convinced. Yeah, I went straight home. Uh, you know, about I waited till the end of the festival, or whatever. Yeah. I came back, and my uncle, um, who was a guitar maker, Patrick O'Toole, I got him to build me an A string straight away. Wow. Um, but it was funny because. There was no real internet in those days, you know. I mean, there was internet, but it wasn't as straightforward as now. And it was really difficult to get any information on, on or, or even to get in touch with Pogger. Right? I was thinking with your uncle too, trying to figure out how, uh, that, that was, I don't know whether there was a, a, yeah, a whole new way of thinking, how do I make this work and then it's going to be... Exactly, yeah, it was a real, it was a real test. And, um, and the first spike was a, a music stand. We oh. had a bolt in there, a music stand. And um, yeah, and then I went back to see, I met Pogger Bait again a year later. And uh, he was blown away, you know, that somebody else was doing it. <laughs> and uh, I, I just thought he had a bunch of people doing it, you know. Right. I didn't know. Uh, he, he, he wasn't, you know, I had assumed that every guitarist in the world, like, taught in a university and had, like, 20 amazing <laughs> students, you know. And he was a real loner. I mean, he just worked at home, worked on his recordings and his, and his performances, and he didn't do any teaching. You know, so. Right. So, because um, you were lucky enough to study with him. I think you went to, you went to, you know, Vienna and stuff. I don't know, you went to, yeah, you, 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 I, Greece, so, you know, you went to. Well, I went a lot. Of, I had to go to a lot of places because you know mm. there wasn't really anybody here for me okay. to study with. Um, and uh, Paul Gabriel, I went to Brazil. Yeah, he invited me to Brazil then, wow. where he lives. 
Sao Paulo. And, and in the back of your mind was this, you know, obviously this is a love and a passion, but the, you must have been thinking, you know, where will this end be? You know, where would you, you're obviously hoping that this would be at a point where you could perform at a level that Paul was performing. And, and sure, yeah. But that, that's quite a, quite a commitment from, from a, you know, a, a kid who's sort of basically in love with an instrument, but doesn't know, there isn't any well-worn pack, well, this is going to make you yeah, uh, no, a I living or... Yeah, I didn't think like that. Right. I just... Um, I wasn't really thinking like that. I mean, I, I just was doing it, you know. Mm. I wasn't really. Uh, it was a period where I had, I had, um, I had won the RDS Music Bursary. I had money to go and study abroad. Right. Um, I felt like I was probably quite naive, and I just thought everything was going to work out great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, I was starting to make friends with 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 guitarists in other countries, you know, and and uh, just getting on that scene, I suppose, and and. Uh, I wasn't really thinking about the long game. Yeah. Right. Mm. Oh, but the long game has been very good to you, though, because you know, you, you've had a huge amount of success and you've played everywhere, the National Concert Hall, you've done festivals all over the world, you, you've played, you've toured with the Chieftains, you've played with, you know, with, with, with various different, with the Irish Baroque and, and you know, the Ulster, um, uh, what was it called, the Ulster Rock? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I don't know whether there was uh, any point that you realised, oh, this is working out, actually, this is all right. Well, I had an important, um, actually, even before I changed to the eight string fully, I met an important guitarist, Scott Tennant, from the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet. Okay. And uh, he was the first guy that said to me, um, well, you could consider doing this. You know, you, you could be professional. I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then I went off and thought about it, you know. And, and uh, I've been lucky. I've met Scott, played with Scott Tennant now a few times. Uh, wow. Group, you know, in, in, in bigger things. And uh, I always say to him, yeah, you know, man, you, you, I, I don't know what I'd be here if it wasn't for a you know, bit of advice. <laughs> Because in Ireland, nobody would say to you, oh, you're great, you, you, you could do Damn this. Damn right. Most of the other guitarists just tell you... Um, Keep you in check. Yeah, especially, you know, especially the old guards were not, were not right. happy when somebody comes through. Yeah, but that's, that's true, and I'd say, you know, in the traditional world and all that, there's a, so, a suspicion oh, yeah. and, a, and a, a dislike almost for, for the idea that somebody <laughs> might come along and not necessarily be better, but just sort of take a bit of their action in some well, way. It's, or, it's, <laughs> not, it's, not, it's not that... Um, so it's one guy, I'm not going to name it's one guy in particular, I think about... It's not that he thinks I might be better than him. He's right. scared that people might think oh, I'm better than him. <laughs> <laughs> right, and that's you enough know, to get the old ego fired up. And well, it doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, you just go to yeah. a concert and, and uh, one guy plays a set of pieces, you play a set of pieces. You're sure. Not, you're not the same. I mean, well, it's, it's like it's like getting angry over a different Beatles song, saying, "Well, I don't, this song isn't as good as that." And it's all good. It's like it's you know, if somebody's yeah. got the heart and soul in it, and the you know, it just has, it has its own particular taste and color, and, and hopefully, it's a little bit their own as well as being a, a beautiful piece that everyone for sure can, I, I yeah. suppose playing the eighth string is it does separate me from the other guitarists in a way you know visually yeah. as well as in pieces i can play right but well, size matters really you know and even yeah. in the classical world <laughs> but was, has it ever felt um is, is it, do you have this sort of a uh, i don't know if a kind of um a message with your head the fact that it is such an odd instrument and, and it is slightly you know you're outside the, the off the menu a little bit and that uh 99% of the time I'm sure that's always a positive but the, uh, you know, we were even just joking on the way down that you know it, it's kind of like people are almost coming as a curiosity piece like oh I've never I wonder yeah, what this yeah. guy can do and well it's funny you know um, for the last few years I was playing with Dublin Guitar Quartet and I was playing the guitar you know this 8 string but on my knee like this uh -huh. and I didn't think I'd care I was happy to do the gigs and it was yeah. a good gig we did and um, it drove me crazy after about 6 months <laughs> <laughs> I thought well even if I wanted to go back yeah. play like this right um i, I don't think i could right. I, I do if i'm teaching guitar i, mean, I teach guitar sure. and uh, um i i don't complicate people with the whole setup yeah. because it's such yeah. a I, i've had one or two guys who've come especially to learn that way but sure um it's a big commitment and they're stuck with me forever then which is maybe you know well i remember that with um billy Cobham. I, I studied drums for a long time and billy Cobham, his teacher used to give out to the, the fact that he just played them differently he played his right hand on the snare and his left hand on the hi-hat and you know, 20 years later, he's one of the most respected drummers in the world and returned to forever huge. And he met his tutor and he sort of said, oh, you know, it, it seemed to work out for me. And he said, but just think how much better you would have been if you played it with the, <laughs> the right way. <laughs> so there's that kind of thing that, what, you know, what makes you strong. There's also that sort of feeling that it's, uh, you know, that some people would think, oh man, you, you, you know, as you say, you, 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 you're so natural now with the eight string. It's the six string that feels odd to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do the odd thing. Um, I borrowed a 19th century guitar that was made in 1820. Wow. Italian Wicklow, uh, David Marshall has lived with me a few times. And nice. I've done a few things on that. Um, you were talking about Irish Baroque Orchestra, I played a yeah. concerto with them. 
using that instrument. Right. Um, which is a six string. And tiny because the guitars were tiny then, you know. Right, right. Well everyone was midgets we were kind of yeah. leprechauns back then yeah, and maybe yeah, you yeah. look at like my, my the old houses are about like four foot off the ground getting through yeah, the door well, and <laughs> there's that, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the the nineteenth century guitars, I mean the guitars got bigger and you're saying about that about the eight string, like that the idea that really around nineteen hundred the guitars got bigger with Andre Segovia started to play these bigger guitars, play bigger halls. Yeah. And then all the guitars were the same size from then on. Right. But you know, before that, guitars were all different sizes and had different amounts of strings and yeah, yeah, um, all sorts of you know, you'd go from one town to another and everything was a little bit different. You know. Well, you look at you, you only have to sort of you know go on good old Google and you'll see that the history of, of a guitar. I mean, the the variations on the shapes and yeah. the and I'm sure each time it was it was the hope was that it would it was unique and it was something that was just a little bit uh, out of the ordinary and yeah you get guys like uh, in the loose you know the famous john dell and the yeah, yeah. This thing did the cd of um he started out on seven string loose then he went to eight and towards the end he's playing ten string loose so hey yeah. <laughs> there's even guys who, who added you know they added extra strings on like they literally i mean like I right. said, they drilled holes in the top and so i'll get a bit spinal tap isn't it yeah. <laughs> to, well, to they tri just triple neck guitar and <laughs> yeah well you know just there's no reason, I mean, with classical guitar, everybody who play, you know, once you get to a certain level, you get a guitar built. It's not like, you don't buy factory guitars, you know, right, they're right. just, there's some decent factory guitars out there, but it's not like electric guitar where you can buy Gibson or Fender sure, and they're pretty really good. And you're, yeah. Maybe you get a bit of customised work done to it, but right. um, because we don't have the amplifier and nothing, it's all the one thing, it has to be hand built to be quality. So when you go to a maker, I mean, you could, ha you could really have anything you wanted, but then you're risking you never sell it sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know so it is a good life then i mean the, the, i don't know whether the 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 um you know early years were a struggle whether you feel you know early on that you you kind of were comfortable and knew well this is going to work out this is okay i can teach and i can i can perform and i can, and this can be a a living rather than just a hobby or a weekend thing yeah yeah well in my teenage years i thought i was gonna be a rock star you know yay hey. you and me both pal yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you can turn off the camera and have a cry for a second <laughs> and come back <laughs> in one of the bands i think we have a letter from today i was a road on a record somebody actually wanted to sign us and then the band split up you know before oh, we actually got you know all these things. that's very rock and roll yeah. that's the way you want to do it but uh, <laughs> but i but i learned an awful lot from doing all that you know yeah. and going out and playing and uh for me, actually, it happened all quite organically because I, I was still in the band when I started college, but it was hard to practice enough on the classical guitar and go to band practice and do the gigs. And right. um, it sort of suited me when the band was, was finally split up, and uh, I could just concentrate on one thing. Yeah, and, uh, and and I'm sure there's there's um, you know, to me it's all the same. It, it's either you know in any genre of music, it's either got soul or it hasn't, and whether it's the Pixies or Puccini or whatever it might be, that it's it's just really down to the fact that there's. A moment there that somebody captured a feeling and whatever way it happened to be expressed is, is uh, fine by me but so yeah, i'm sure as you yeah. say that the, 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 those sort of uh, rock and roll days it's all part of the same thing really yeah the classical thing can be tough because there's such a emphasis on perfectionism you know right. and, and uh, no small mistakes or anything you're trying to really play everything perfectly and, and uh, it's really in the risk that something happens you know so if you're risking sure making a mistake that's yeah. usually when the best things happen. You have to be on the edge. I mean, yeah. everybody, if, if I went out and played like I was playing competition, then nobody would come, you know. Yeah, again. yeah. So and uh, you have to go yeah. for it. And, and maybe that's something I learned in, in, the, in the band. That's yeah. Oh, you need a little bit of feedback every now and again, a little kind of like a strain or a little, you know, something that just sort of suggests yeah. that this is an effort. It's not just exactly, played yeah. out by yeah. Rota and, uh, yeah. So I don't know whether you'd like to finish now. You did play a beautiful piece at the start. I don't know whether he wants to, to finish with a piece or you uh, might yeah. feel that you, you've... Um, no, I'll play some bar, okay? Where's the right. chamber? Maybe you can cut this out. Just to <laughs> this is a Ravi Shankar song, isn't it? Uh, yeah, there actually is. There's a Ravi Shankar uh, piece for blue and guitar. All oh, right. Well, he had that famous moment in Bangladesh, concert in Bangladesh, yeah. where he tuned up and got a huge round of applause, and he had to thank everybody for applauding his tuning. Yeah. <laughs> That's the old joke, the Chinese song, tuning. <laughs> Well, they say the loop players, you know, that they, they spend one half their life um, tuning their loops and, and the other half playing out a tune. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say Sting spends a lot of time tuning his loops. Yeah, but I like, you know, I like the Sting album. I think it's, I think it's good. It's yeah, but the only thing is that it's got Sting on it. Yeah. <laughs> Other than it's that, it's grand. If, if, you're, if you're looking for it, you know, you want to hear a recording of Bell and there's something and you, you yeah. check it on iTunes and 
they all sort of have one and a half star rating and then the sting one's just like glowing you know with ah, millions yeah. of records so well he spends a lot of time online under different names <laughs> <laughs> And Judy helps him sometimes, you know. It's part of the tantric sex thing. It's oh, just okay. going online writing. It, get, it gets him off. Are you really going to have to put on it? Uh, so this is a Bach prelude, prelude to the first cello suite, which I am playing in the, in the concert. Oh, nice. Roll. 